Senator from I've New Hampshire, our, most, our most eloquent member has Absolutely. arrived on the floor, uh, not to mention other attributes <laughs> that, that we are lacking in. Well, I would like all three of you to comment um, on this proposition. You've just challenged the president, who's the commander in chief, by the way, to fix a problem that your secretary of defense has said would be the most devastating thing possible to our ability to defend ourselves. He said it would be catastrophic, it would be draconian, there's no way to plan for it, we'd be shooting ourselves in the head. Now, Mr. President, you're the commander in chief. When your secretary of defense and every general under your command is telling you in the Congress, you need to fix this before it gets out of hand, why aren't you asking us as Republicans and Democrats to answer the call of the Secretary of Defense? You're the Commander in Chief, my friend. It is your job to make sure that our military has what it needs to go fight wars that we send them to fight and protect our nation. But that's not enough. It is also our job as members of Congress to take care of those who serve. So to our Republican and Democratic leader, why don't you convene a group of senators and to our leaders in the House, why don't you get a group of House members and ask us to come up with a plan to do at least one thing, avoid the consequence of sequestration for one year in 2013 to take the monkey off their back. I am willing to meet our Democratic friends in the middle to find a way to offset the $110 billion in defense and non-defense spending. But to our leaders and to the President, if you think the rest of us are going to sit on the sidelines and let this matter be taken up and lame duck when it becomes a nightmare for the country, you can forget it. So we're challenging our leaders and the President to get a group together to fix this. Senator McCain, do you think that's a good idea or not? I know it's the only way we're going to solve this. I'd ask unanimous consent the senator from New Hampshire be included, and I know the senator from Tennessee, our friend Mr. Senator Corker, is waiting, but uh, I, I, th I think the, my, my friend from South Carolina, has, you, as usual, has stated the problem and a solution here. The problem is we face devastating impact on our national security. The solution is, is for our leaders and the president, I I if possible, uh, convene a group of senators, whether it includes us or not, is immaterial, uh, on both sides of the aisle, on both sides of the Capitol, to sit down and work out so we can avoid the sequester. I will take responsibility for a sequester, if that's what's necessary. But I also say that uh, without concrete, significant, and meaningful action to cause this sequester to be prevented. We are risking the lives of our young men and women who are serving in the military. I don't know of a greater responsibility that we have. Mr. President, I asked the senator from New Hampshire if she... The senator from New Hampshire is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I join with my colleagues over the concern, a deep concern, it keeps me up at night about sequestration because uh, we cannot do this to our national security, and both sides of the aisle have to come together. We need leadership from our Commander-in-Chief on this issue, because to put it in perspective, I asked the Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps what the impact of sequestration would be on the Marines, and you know what he told me? That the Marine Corps of the United States of America would be unable to respond to one major contingency. Talk about putting our country at risk and uh, putting ourselves in a situation where, unfortunately, there are still so many risks around the world that our country needs to be protected from, uh, to think that our Marine Corps wouldn't be able to respond to one major contingency. It's outrageous, and it really cries for bipartisan leadership on this issue, and particularly leadership from our Commander-in-Chief. And to put it in perspective, it's not just uh, it's not just an issue of our national security. You would think that would be enough to bring people to the table. But we are talking about jobs across this country. The National Association of Manufacturers has estimated that it would be nearly a million jobs. George Mason University, the same. 
And to my colleagues, uh, to looking around here, just at pulling some states in terms of the estimates of job losses, 24,000 for, for Alabama. Uh, when we look at a state uh, like Missouri, 31,000. Uh, when we look at a state, for example, like uh, Florida, uh, there are thousands of jobs to see, 39,000 for Florida. This is an issue that will hit every state in this nation. Uh, but most importantly, what I'm concerned about is it's going to hit our military in a way that we break faith with our troops. In fact, General Odiorno of our Army has said that we would have to cut an additional 100,000 troops from our Army on top of the reductions that we are making right now, approximately 72,000, and 50 percent of it would have to come from the Guard and Reserve. And you think about the important function not only of protecting our country, we could not have fought in Afghanistan or Iraq without our Guard and Reserve. I'm the proud wife of, of uh, someone who served in the Iraq War, and I can tell you this, that it's not only the function that our Guard and Reserve play in terms of protecting us uh, overseas, but they also perform a very important homeland function, and every governor in this country will be deeply concerned if we're going to diminish our Guard and Reserve. So this is an issue that cries out for leadership from both sides of the aisle. I look forward to working with my colleagues on this now. It cannot wait till a lame duck session. We cannot put our national security in the balance and nearly a million jobs at issue uh, till a lame duck session. This is something we should resolve right now. And I appreciate that my colleagues have come to the floor to talk about this issue today. Uh, we, we must get this done on behalf of the American people and our men and women in uniform. I thank you, Mr. President, and I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Illinois. I think Senator Corker from Tennessee was on the floor before me. Uh, I don't know if we're going back and forth or how long he expects to speak, but I'd like to yield to him to say what his plans are. Mr. President. Senator from Tennessee. I thank the gentleman uh, from Illinois. I'm going to speak for about uh, two and a half or three minutes, if that's okay. I'd be happy to yield to the senator from Tennessee and ask consent that I follow him. No. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I uh, appreciate the comments of my friends from New Hampshire and Arizona and South Dakota, I mean South Carolina, regarding the, the sequestration. I will say the reason that we're in this sequestration mode is that six Republicans and six Democrats could not figure out a way over a 10-year period to cut $1.2 trillion in spending uh, out of $45 trillion that are going to be spent by the federal government during that period of time. And so I do hope there's a way to resolve that. But I'm here to speak about something related, uh, but in some ways very different. Uh, today we're getting ready to vote on some legislation dealing with flood insurance, uh, dealing with uh, uh, student lending, uh, dealing with highways, and these are all very popular programs. And what people in the, who are listening who may be paying attention to what the Senate uh, is doing today, what they may not know is that for the third time, in a bipartisan way, this body is getting ready to spend more money than was deemed by the budget that was ultimately created by the Budget Control Act just last year when the country almost shut down trying to save a mere $900 billion over the next 10 years. So a vote today for this piece of legislation is basically a vote to say that the United States Senate cannot be entrusted to carry out the things that it laid out last August to keep us from spending money that we do not have. And so, Mr. President, I know there's going to be some budget point of orders that will be brought forth at some point later today. I just want to say as one senator from Tennessee, it continues to be unbelievable to me that this body does not have the courage, does not have the will, does not have the discipline to even live within a very modest budget that was laid out last August. Today, I'm certain that we are going to pass legislation that spends billions of dollars more than we agreed to by the Budget Control Act and especially the deemed budget that came after that, the deemed budget that was put in place as a result of what we, put, of what we passed last August. So I would say all those 
who vote for this today are basically saying we do not have the discipline to live within our means. The problems that our nation faces fiscally are only going to get worse. And uh, I think this is a very sad day for our country if that, in fact, is what happens within the next two or three hours on the Senate floor. With that, Mr. President, I yield the floor. Mr. President. And I'm from Illinois. I thank the senator from Tennessee uh, for his comments, and I share his concern about our deficit. I was a member of the simpson bowles Commission, voted for the commission report, bipartisan effort to reduce the deficit by $4.5 trillion over 10 years. Uh, I think we set in place a description, um, maybe a guidepost for how we can do this. And um, I would agree with him that we need to take care in the money that we spend now, which will add to the deficit, though I have to say that my understanding is that this transportation bill is paid for. They, there are revenue sources that are part of this. I know that the student loan um, continued decrease in interest rates to 3.4 percent for student loans is paid for, and I believe the changes within the flood insurance program, which is part of this package as well, uh, the Republican leader spoke to this morning, reforms in that program will move it closer to sustainability and solvency. It is not where it needs to be, but it is moving closer. But I want to address, if I can for a minute, what has been a topic on the floor this morning about the planned cuts in the Department of Defense. Let me say at the outset what we all agree on. Number one, we never, ever want to shortchange America's security nor shortchange our men and women in uniform. A, a nephew of mine who served as a doorman right up here in the gallery recently returned from one year in Afghanistan. Uh, we were sending packages, worried about Michael every day, got home safely. That's happening over and over again across America. I wanted my nephew to have all that he needed to come home safely. And I think everyone feels the same when it comes to the Department of Defense. Now let's step back and look at this deficit debate and allow me to put it in a little perspective for a moment. The last time we balanced the federal budget was not in the 19th century. It was about 11 years ago. It was a time when William Jefferson Clinton was president of the United States, and for three years we had a balanced budget under a Democratic president. Three years of balanced budget. When we reached a balanced budget, if you step back and said, well, what do you have in terms of spending and revenue? They're the same. Here's what we found. Revenue and spending both equaled 19.5% of America's gross domestic product. Gross domestic product is the sum total of the values of goods and services produced in America every year. It changes, it grows. And the last year we were in balance, taxes equaled 19.5% of our gross domestic product. Federal spending equaled 19.5%. And we had a balanced budget. Now we're in deep water. We saw the accumulated debt of the United States more than double under President George W. Bush and it continues to grow because of the recession under this president. Our annual deficits are over a trillion dollars and unsustainable. Unsustainable. We borrow 40 cents for every dollar we spend, whether we're buying military equipment or paying for food stamps. We borrow 40 cents. That's unsustainable. But now that we know there was a time when we were in balance, it is fair to say, well, what's happened to spending since this budget was in balance? If you do it in constant dollars, so there's no monkeying around with numbers here, constant dollars, here's what happened since we were last in balance in our budget. Domestic discretionary spending equals student loans, medical research, transportation, all of the different things that don't fit in the Department of Defense the spending in those areas since we were last in balance has been flat, no increase, no increase. What about spending for entitlement programs? Medicare, Medicaid, programs like that, veterans care. What has happened to them since we were last in balance? Since we were last in balance, the spending on entitlement programs has gone up 30%. Why? 
The baby boomers have arrived. 10,000 people a day reach the age of 65. They've paid into Social Security and Medicare their whole lives, and they show up now and say, it's our turn. And because of that, entitlement spending has gone up. Now let's look at the third part of the budget, which was addressed by my Republican colleagues this morning, defense spending. What has happened to defense spending since the budget was in balance? Domestic discretionary flat, entitlements 30%. As of this year's budget, defense spending will have risen 73%, 73% since the budget was last in balance. So we created a super committee. Senator Kerry, Massachusetts, was a member, and said find ways to reduce the deficit by $1.2 trillion over 10 years. They tried, and I'm sure Senator Kerry will speak to that effort. At the end of the day, they couldn't reach a bipartisan agreement on how it would be done. So the law we passed said, well, if you can't reach an agreement, then we're going to do it automatically. We're going to take $500 billion out of defense and $500 billion out of non-defense spending. That's what this is about. People are coming to the floor and saying, we can't take another $500 billion out of defense spending. I will tell you, I think that is a lot to be taken out in light of what we've already anticipated we're going to reduce spending. I think it will cause some serious problems, but I reject the notion that that $500 billion, if it's taken out of domestic discretionary, won't have equally horrible results. So I say to my friends on the other side of the aisle, when you had a chance in the super committee to deal with spending cuts of a lesser amount or to deal with revenue, closing tax loopholes, you walked away from it. Now you're complaining that we may end up cutting defense spending. Incidentally, if the sequestration number went through the additional $500 billion in cuts over the next 10 years, it would bring the amount of money we spend on defense to the same percentage of the gross domestic product as it was when the budget was in balance. So, my friends who are speaking for the national defense, I join you. But I also speak for investments in America when it comes to education, innovation, and infrastructure, which will help our economy grow. And sequestration on the domestic side is unacceptable from this senator's point of view as well. What do we need to do? We clearly need to get beyond this and talk about an honest answer to reducing the deficit. And an honest answer, going back to Simpson-Bowles, puts everything on the table. Everything. To my friends on the other side of the aisle, it puts revenue on the table. It must. To my friends on this side of the aisle, it puts entitlement programs on the table. And it must. And it includes spending cuts. That is the only honest way to address this. But to pick it off and say we're going to take the one area of the budget that has grown in spending by 73% and hold it harmless, ignore it, and then have them say, and we won't touch revenue, leaves two possibilities. If we're going to do anything about the deficit. Deeper cuts in programs like student loans, medical research, or cuts in Medicare. That's what it comes down to. Hard choices, right? That's why I think the bowl Simpson approach by putting everything on the table was the right approach. And I would urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to take this pain that we are facing December 31st and turn it into an opportunity to work on a bipartisan basis to reduce this deficit. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Utah. Mr. President, I stand to raise a concern that I have with regard to the conference committee report to accompany H.R. 4348. Pursuant to paragraph 9 of Rule 28 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, we're supposed to have adequate notice of a report like this before we have the opportunity to vote on it. The provision states that it shall not be in order to vote on the adoption of a report of a committee of conference unless such report has been made available to members and to the general public for at least 48 hours before such a vote. Now the current version of the committee report was filed as I understand it at 8.07 p.m. last night. Uh, it's not even close to the 48 hours required notice. What we have ultimately, Mr. President, when we look at this is uh, the fact that we have a highway bill that was sent to conference, but it came back from closed door negotiations with a student loan bill and also with a flood insurance bill attached to it. We were neither given the chance to debate 
uh, nor given the chance to amend these provisions uh, before they came to the floor, and now we're approaching a vote on that. We did not provide our fellow senators or the American people with an adequate opportunity to read the 596-page conference report that's required by our very own rules. This is somewhat reminiscent of a statement made a few years ago by then Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi when speaking to members of her body uh, regarding the uh, passage of the Affordable Care Act, she said, we have to pass the bill so that you can find out what's in it. This is one of the problems that we have in Washington, one of the problems that the American people are becoming increasingly aware of. It's a problem that I think we need to address. Time and time again, we have a problem in which the Senate waits until the day before a holiday or the day before a scheduled in-state work period before bringing something to the floor for a vote without following the Senate's own rules, rules that were designed to promote and protect the openness and transparency of the legislative process. This is a troubling trend, and it's a trend that we should seek to avoid whenever, wherever possible. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President. The Senator from Kentucky. Currently, Congress has about a 10 percent approval rate. One of the reasons is we don't even obey our own rules. For goodness sakes, 600-page bill, and I got it this morning. Not one member of the Senate will read this bill before we vote on it. We're going to vote on this in the next 30 minutes. I and Senator Lee and others will object to this. We'll have a point of order that our own rules say that it has to be posted online for 48 hours. 600 pages. No one will read it. No wonder our approval rating is 10 percent. Nobody knows what we're voting on. In fact, things have been stuck in this bill last night that have nothing to do with any of these bills, and they've been stuck in, and we're just now discovering it. I passed two senators in the hall going back to their office, still trying to get out something that's been written into this bill that affects their state that they found out minutes ago. Had they not found out about it, nobody would have known about it. Three bills that are in question here, transportation bill, student loan bill, the student loan bill, originally we had the loans at 6 percent, and it was somehow bringing in money to the Treasury. We were using that money to pay for Obamacare. Now it's at 3 percent. That money's gone. Where's the money to pay for Obamacare? We have a shell game up here. We say one thing's going to pay for it. Now this is going to pay for it. Money disappears. Now what they're saying is they're going to pay for this by taking money out of pensions. Raise your hand if you think it's a good idea to underfund pensions more. Over half of the pensions in this country are technically insolvent because they don't have enough money to pay for them. Is it a good idea to have less money go into workers' pension to pay for a student loan program? I have a bill in Congress that says we should read the bills before we pass them. It says that we should wait one day for each 20 pages. So we'd be given time to read 600-page bills. But at the very least, we ought to adhere to our own rules. Our rules say that it should be posted online at least 48 hours. 48 hours is still a challenge to find out everything in here. You know how long the Federal Register is? It's 55,000 pages added annually. It's hundreds of thousands of pages. So when you read this, you have to refer to the Federal Register that's hundreds of thousands of pages to find out what they've stuck in this bill in the dead of night. This isn't the way we should operate. The American people want to know, why do we all of a sudden say, oh, the government's going to shut down if we don't do something in three days? Well, what were they doing for the previous three months? What's going on up here? The other side hasn't produced a budget in three years. That's against the rules. The rules of the Senate say you must produce a budget, and they didn't do it for three years. When we presented them with their own budget that we wrote for them, nobody voted for it. Zero on the other side of the aisle voted for their own president's budget. How are we going to get to compromise if they're not showing up for work? How are we going to get anything done if they don't obey their own rules? I'm discouraged by this. I will raise a point of order in the next hour that says we have broken the rules of the Senate, and I will ask them to vote on it. I fully expect the parliamentarian will rule in our favor. We'll see. But then the other side will simply 
close their eyes to the rules. They won't care what the parliamentarian says, and they will just overturn this by saying, we are the majority, and we deem it so. We are the majority. We don't care what's in the bills. We don't care to take the time to read the bills. We are in the majority, and we deem it so. I think this is why the American people are unhappy with what's going on in this body. I object strenuously to it. I will vote against this, and I will raise a point of order that says we should read the bills before we pass them. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, Senator from Alabama. I thank Senator Paul for raising these issues. Uh, we are mismanaging the American people's money. It's good to see Senator Lee, who just spoke, and Senator Paul, new members to the uh, United States Senate who have been out talking to the American people, who made commitments that they're going to work to try to improve the process here. And I, I celebrate uh, their activity, their vigor, and their determination. And a lot of others feel the same way in our body. Uh, Mr. President, we'll be moving a cobble together bill here shortly. An uh, attempt will be done to accomplish that. And I expect budget points of order, another point of order to be raised. Uh, I just wanted to share some thoughts about how it is we do business and some of the uh, efforts that aren't legitimate as we go about our business and are dangerous to the health financially of America. Let's take what we call the Lust Fund. It's an odd name. The true name of it is the uh, uh, Leaking Underground Storage Tank Fund. People that have storage tanks have to pay fees. It goes into a fund, and the idea of that fund is to be available when cleanups need to be done, and the company or other companies have gone bankrupt and there's no money. This fund will pay to clean up the f a waste. Makes sense, maybe. Uh, it's been operating for quite a number of years. It's run up a surplus. Now, that surplus is in the Lust Trust Fund, the Leaking Underground Storage Tank Fund. And how, where does it go? What do you do with that money? Well, the Treasury of the United States is spending more money every year than it takes in. Uh, we, we, this year, we will spend approximately $3.7 trillion. We take in about $2.2 trillion and have $1,300 billion deficit. That's how much we're spending. It's around 3.7 trillion, taking in about 2.4 trillion, having about a, uh, a 1.3 trillion dollar deficit this year, the fourth consecutive year. We've had over a thousand billion dollar deficit. We'll have a big one again next year because we're systemically overspending. But let's look at this this fund, and has some real money in it. Uh, uh, a number of billions of dollars, and what happens to it? Well, when the government spends more money than it takes in, it takes the money from the lust fund. Well, how does it get it? It borrows it. So there's a, actually a debt instrument from the United States Treasury to the trustees or the holders or the managers of the lust trust fund, and they've loaned the money. They don't need it today. They loan it to the government so they can spend it. And it's been borrowed and has been spent, and the assets in the Lust Fund are nothing more than, than debt instruments from the United States Treasury. But on the books, it appears that this Lust Fund has assets. I guess, in a sense, it does. It has U.S. Treasury notes. And so the people looking around to spend money and to try to meet the demands of our constituents to build highways, in this case, decided they can take that money. And you know something? It does not score as a, 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 an expenditure in that fashion. It's, it's, it's an odd way this is done. It's not properly, and it's seen as a found money that can go over and be spent. But where does the money come from? The money is not in the fund, remember. Only the fund holds treasury bills. The highway uh, trust fund doesn't want treasury bills. It wants money. It can be spent. And so what happens is the United States Treasury, which has been borrowing money from another government agency 
and giving a debt instrument in return has to come up with the money now. If it's going to be spent, it's going to be taken out of the trust fund, where do they get the money? They convert an internal debt to an external debt. Only thing they're done, they will do is borrow more money. So it will be this many billion dollars more than 1.2, 1.3 trillion dollars we have. And, and the debt is converted to a public debt and somebody in China or somebody in Japan or somebody in uh, New York will uh, loan money to the government and they'll use that money to pay the highway trust fund with. You see how circular that is? And it allows the money to be double counted. And that's actually what happened uh, with um, the uh, President Obama's health care bill. $400 billion was funded this way. Social Security still has a surplus. Although it's been drawn down, it still has a surplus in its account. Uh, or Medicare does. And so the uh, Medicare trustees raise Medicare taxes, they cut Medicare benefits, and they save $400 billion. And under that, which would be money of the Social Security, of the Medicare and the trustees. It's their money. Well, what happens with it? <clears throat> Under the conventions of accounting, the money was uh, available to be spent by the U.S. Treasury. And the U.S. Treasury uh, then would spend it on the new health care bill. And the Congressional Budget Office Director, Mr. Elmendorf, uh, wrote me a letter the night before the bill passed, Christmas Eve, and he said, this is double counting the money. You can't simultaneously count it as making Medicare better and providing new money to fund the health care bill with. $400 billion on the night before the vote, he announces uh, this is double counting. If a private business were to do it, they would uh, be in big trouble, I suggest. They, they might be uh, sued for fraud. They would be sued for fraud. So the money was uh, done in that fashion, and the way it happened was, Mr. Elmendorf said, it's double counting the money. You can't simultaneously benefit Medicare and fund a new health care program, uh, although the conventions of accounting might suggest otherwise. And so the real smart financiers, what did they do? They figured out how to use it, the, the uh, conventions of accounting in a way that obscured the fact that they didn't have the $400 billion. And it was barred money, in truth. Mr. President, I see my colleagues on the floor. and Would you yield the floor? Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, Senator from Oklahoma. I just have a couple of comments to make that, um, I, for clarification purposes, I, I uh, first of all, I don't think anyone's going to question my uh, conservative credentials over the years that I've been here. Um, but, and I've been, uh, just, I've been really offended by a lot of the things that have happened structurally in this institution over in the House. But, but insofar as this bill is concerned, let me just kind of clarify a couple of things. It sounds real good to stand up here and say that we've only had a matter of minutes to look at something that's 500 pages. We've had this bill for a long time, for several days. We've, had, we've gone over everything. On the bill that we sent from the Senate to the House is essentially the same thing. Now, I, I don't agree when they added the, uh, the two provisions on student loan and flood insurance. I didn't agree with that. Everyone knows those issues, but I don't think they should have been on here. Nonetheless, that we didn't have any uh, control in this body over that. But as far as the provisions of the bill are concerned, these provisions we have seen, and everyone who's spoken against it has been there when we've talked about the, the, uh, the great reforms, and I've commented several times that uh, I thought one of the problems was we did too good of a job because we had too many reforms. Uh, and, 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 and when it got over to the House, where they're incli inclined to have uh, more reforms in there, they had to start from a base where we had done a good job, streamlining, uh, enhancements. All these things are in it. And I only can say, just from a conservative perspective, We've seen this bill, we've lived with this bill, not just hours, not, but, but for days, and actually for weeks. 
the basic uh, uh, provisions of the bill. But what we have to realize is that there is an alternative to what we're doing here today. And that alternative, and the only alternative, only alternative, is to go back to extensions. And when you go to extensions, a couple of things happen. Number one, you don't have any of the reforms that we have. Number two, you throw away about 30% of the money. And Mr. President, Mr. President. Would my, friend the majority yield, would my friend yield for question? Yes, of course. Mr. President, through the chair to my friend, the ranking member of this committee, it's true, is it not, that basically the same bill that we are going to vote on today passed this institution in March? It, it is true. I say through the chair, it passed the, this institution with 74 votes, as I recall. And so, uh, again, people have had since March to read this bill, kind of get up to it a little bit, don't you think? I uh, answer in the affirmative. With my friend, but, but before yielding, my friend yield further for one minute. I just want to correct the record. There are a few changes. That's no question. We we speeded up project delivery, as my friend knows. We've we gave a little more flexibility to the states and uh, in terms of uh, the uh, the TE program. So a few things were changed. But my friends are right. Primarily, this is a similar bill. It's it it takes the money and we say we're going to spend the same thing plus inflation. And it's true, these, these bills have been out here for a long time, actually passed our committee, Senator Inhofe, in November of last year. I, I respond, yes, that is correct, that is accurate. I think that's very important, too, because we've been talking about this bill for a long period of time. We actually started trying to get a highway reauthorization bill way back in 2009 when the old bill from 2005 expired. But these provisions, the problem is, and I want to get back on where I was, there is an alternative to this bill. If you defeat this bill, we go back to extensions. If you go back to extensions, first of all, you're losing about 30% of the money off the top. Everybody knows that. And secondly, you don't get these reforms. If people are concerned out there, conservatives, that they're not getting, a, a, that, that they're, they're going to defeat this and go back to extensions, they're not going to have reform of the enhancements. You know, the, the law requires right now that 2% or 10%, depending on how you want to uh, put it, if it's 2% from total funding or 10% uh, uh, of total funding or 2% of surface transportation, that has to be spent on transportation enhancements. Now, my good friend, the senator, the, the chairman of the committee, uh, that had this, Senator Boxer, she and I disagree on enhancements. She likes them, I don't. I want money to be spent on, on concrete, I want roads, bridges. This is what well, I think we should be doing. But that's a disagreement that we had. So we had a compromise where she can have, and uh, anyone can have what they want. This is an oversimplification, but it means, yeah, this money is going to be put into something that can be enhancements, but in my state of Oklahoma, it's not going to be an enhancement. It's going to be paying for some of the unfunded mandates. It's going to be paying for things that we have to do in terms of the environment and things that are required. So we've solved that problem. Now, if we don't pass this bill, we go right back and it's going to have to go to enhancements. Streamlining, all the streamlining that is in this in, in terms, environmental streamlining. You talk to any of the road contractors out there and they'll tell you about the waste of money and the number of miles of roads they can't do because of some of these, these requirements, these environmental requirements. We have streamlined those requirements. Now, if we don't pass this bill, we're going to go back to, uh, back to extensions and that same thing is going to, have, we're going to lose all of those opportunities. So not only will it cost more, you're not going to get the, the streamlining. And I would say this, I'm very proud of, of a group that's always supported me. It's the American Conservative Union. Is there anyone around here who doesn't think the American Conservative Union is conservative? I have made a part of the record when I made a speech yesterday, and I put a, an editorial by Al Cardenas, the chairman of the American Conservative Union. It was an op-ed piece. And let me just read two short paragraphs. Mr. President, one paragraph says, I'm quoting now. This is in the op-ed piece from the American Conservative Union. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution specifically lists interstate road building as one of the delineated powers and responsibilities vested in the federal government. In the Federalist Papers No. 42, James Madison makes an early case for the federal government's role in maintaining a healthy infrastructure by stating, quote, nothing which tends to facilitate the intercourse between states can be deemed unworthy of public care. 
And he goes on to say, this is the American Conservative Union. Perhaps most importantly is, those of us who believe in the constitutional conservatism understand that unlike all of the things the federal government uh, wastes our money on, transportation spending is at the core of what constitutes legitimate spending. That's American Conservative Union. I, I just want people to understand that this is the, the voting for this is the conservative approach. You get more for the money that's being spent, and it has all the streamlining in it, and this is our constitutional responsibility. This is what we're supposed to do, and there are only two ways of doing it. One way is to pass this bill, and the other is to operate on extensions, and I just think it's very important for people to understand that. With that, I yield the floor. The absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Cocktail.
Majority Leader. I ask unanimous consent to call the quorum be terminated. Without objection. I have one unanimous consent request for a committee to meet during today's session. Both Senator McConnell and I have approved this. I ask consent that the request be agreed to and that this request be printed in the record. Without objection. <clears throat> Mr. President, I now ask unanimous consent that notwithstanding the lack of receipt of the papers with respect to the conference report to company HR 4348 at 1255 p.m. today, the Senate proceed to a series of stacked votes as outlined in this agreement. Did the time until then be equally divided between the two leaders or the designees. The only points of order in order to the conference report be, a budget, be budget points of order or points of order relative to Rule 28, which is scope of conference or Rule 28, paragraph 9, availability. That if a Rule 28 scope of conference point of order, Rule 28 availability point of order or budget related point of order is made against the conference report and an applicable motion to waive is made during any debate time, the Senate proceed to vote on the motion to waive in order they were raised following the use or yielding back of the time. That if the motions to waive are successful, the Senate proceed to vote on the adoption of the conference report. The adoption of the conference report being subject to a 60 affirmative vote threshold. That there be two minutes equally divided in the usual form prior to each vote. And all after the first vote be 10 minute votes. And Mr. President, I uh, ask that consent in spite of the fact that the votes may not come right after each other. Have the first vote, regular time, all the rest of the votes today will be 10 minute votes. Further, that if the conference report is adopted, the title amendment be agreed to, the finally that no motions to recommit be in order to the conference report. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. The majority leader. Time to have 55 not having arrived. I note the absence of quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Further Republican leader. I ask consent that further proceedings on the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. And Mr. President, on behalf of Senator Paul, I raise a point of order that the conference report on H.R. 4348 has not been publicly available for 48 hours as required by Rule 28, Paragraph 9. I move to waive Paragraph 9. I, I, the majority leader. Mr. President, I move to, <coughs> to waive the provision Senator McConnell just noted. That's, that's uh, Rule 9 of Paragraph 9 of Rule 28. The question is on a motion to waive. Yes, yes. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be a sufficient second. There is a sufficient second. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Mr. Alexander. Ms. Ayotte. Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Balkis. Mr. Beckage. Mr. Bennett. Mr. Bingaman, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt. Aye. Mr. Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer, Mr. Brown of Massachusetts, Mr. Brown of Ohio, Mr. Berg. 
Okay. Maggie, okay. Ms. Cantwell. Mr. Carden. Mr. Carper. Mr. Casey. Mr. Chambliss. Mr. Coates. Mr. Coburn. Mr. Cochran. Ms. Collins. Mr. Conrad. Mr. Coons. Mr. Corker. Mr. Cornyn. Mr. Crapo. Mr. Dement. Mr. Durbin. Mr. Enzi. Mrs. Feinstein. Mr. Franken. Mrs. Gillibrand. Mr. Graham. Mr. Grassley. Mrs. Hagen, Mr. Harkin, Mr. Hatch, Mr. Heller, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hutchison, Mr. Inhoff, Mr. Noway. <coughs> Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johans, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, Mr. Carey, Mr. Kirk, Ms. Klobuchar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Kyle. Ms. Landrum. Mr. Lautenberg. Mr. Lee, Mr. Levin, Mr. Lieberman, Mr. Luger, Mr. Manchin, Mr. McCain, Mrs. McCaskill, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Ms. Mikulski, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Nelson of Nebraska, Mr. Nelson of Florida, Mr. Paul, Mr. Portman, Mr. Pryor, Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, Mr. Reed of Nevada, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Rockefeller, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Sessions, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Snow, 
Ms. Stabenow. Mr. Tester. Mr. Thune. Mr. Toomey. Mr. Udall of Colorado. Of New Mexico, Mr. Vitter, Mr. Warner, Mr. Webb. Senators voting in the affirmative. Bingaman, Blumenthal, Boxer, Brown of Ohio, Inhofe, Johan, Leahy, Luger, McConnell, Mikulski, and Reed of Nevada. Senators voting in the negative. Ayotte, Coates, Kyle, Paul, Roberts, and Sessions. Mrs. Murray. Mrs. Murray, aye. <coughs> Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, aye. Mr. Graham, aye. Mr. Graham, no. Mr. Corker, no. Ms. Cantwell, aye. McCain, no. Mr. Graham, aye. Mr. Vitter, aye. Mr. Rockefeller, aye. Mr. Tester, aye. Mr. Franken, aye. Mr. Heller, aye. Ms. Collins. Ms. Collins, aye.
Mr. Sanders, aye. Ms. Klobuchar, aye. Mr. Burr, no. Mr. John Mr. Johnson, Wisconsin, no. Mr. Brown of Massachusetts, aye. Mr. Hoven, aye. Mr. Rubio, no. Mr. Cornyn, no. Mr. Warner, aye. Mr. Enzi, aye. Mr. Beckage, aye. Mr. Chambliss, aye. Mr. Isaacson, aye. Mr. Durbin, Mr. Durbin. Aye. Mr. Toomey, no. Mr. Moran, aye. Mr. Moran, no. Mr. Shelby, aye. Mr. Johnson, South Dakota, aye. This is Gillibrand, aye. Mr. Lee, no. Mr. Nelson, Mr. Nelson of Florida, aye. Mrs. Hutchison, aye. Mr. Manchin, aye. Mr. Grassley, no. Mr. Wyden, aye. Mr. Dement, no. Mr. Carey. Mr. Carey, aye. Mr. Udall of New Mexico, aye. Mr. Conrad. Mr. Conrad, aye. Mr. Levin. Mr. Levin, aye. Mr. Carden. Mr. Carden, aye. Mr. Portman, no.
Mr. Bozeman, aye. Mr. Lieberman, aye. Mr. Casey, aye. Mrs. Feinstein, aye. Mr. Cochran. Mr. Cochran, aye. Mr. Menendez, aye. Mr. Nelson, Nebraska, aye. Mr. Wicker, aye. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Schumer, aye. Mr. Risch, no. Mr. Hatch, no. Ms. Murkowski? Ms. Murkowski, aye. Mr. Cole? Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Coons, aye. Mrs. Shaheen. Aye. <coughs> Mr. Pryor. Aye. Mrs. McCaskill. Aye. Mr. Akaka. Aye. Mrs. Hagan. Aye. Ms. Snow. Ms. Snow. No. Ms. Tabernow. Ms. Tabernow. Aye. Mr. Webb, aye. Mr. Thune, aye. Mr. Blunt, aye. I do now. Mr. Crapo, no. Mr. Hat, Mr. Harkin, aye. Mr. Baucus, Mr. Baucus, aye. Mr. Barrasso, aye. Mr. Merkley, aye.
Mr. Lautenberg, aye. Mr. Carper, aye. Ms. Landrew, aye. Mr. Whitehouse, aye. 